uh, I would like to move on to our panel discussion. So we wanted to create this opportunity to have a bit more time to unpack all of these ideas from different perspectives, from archival practitioners and um, artists, uh, kind of the creative side from preservation. We are very lucky to have uh, the curator of contemporary fiction film um, at the BFI, Will Massa, for us to moderate this panel. You can see him waving there. Um, and he'll be joined by Kat, um, William and Yessa. Um, so over to you, Will. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, yes, so you, the, you might have noticed that uh, there's a bit of an erroneous quality to me in, in that fiction is in my job title rather than non-fiction. Um, but I hope that gives me an opportunity to ask some questions from uh, perhaps a possibly slightly outsider status when it comes to documentary. Um, and uh, my panellists need no introduction uh, so I'm going to, to dive straight in but I just wanted to say before I do how wonderful it is to be here and see everyone all these wonderful colleagues from around the world um, even in these difficult times it's been really exciting and inspiring to hear you all talk um, we don't have very long so I'm going to I'm going to jump in now so the first question I asked um, Jesse and Rasa when they invited me to do this was well what makes you think that documentary and interactive documentary are any more challenging potentially uh, for archivists and curators than any other form of immersive or interactive media, be it a video game or a work of fiction or, or animation. Um, and now that I've heard you all speak, I can hear that there are some genuinely interesting specificities, but I'd like to get into that if we can um, and ask uh, uh, Katerina if she wouldn't mind commenting. What is it particularly about interactive non-fiction work documentary that you think potentially provides a unique challenge to the archive and curatorial domain. Thanks, Will. Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> and um, I guess I would point to um, the challenges that interactive, immersive, and emergent uh, documentaries uh, provide for documentary as a field in itself. And in particular, I think we've touched on it several times, is the interactivity and the participatory nature. So um, it uh, com complicates the relationship between the maker, the subject, the audience. Um, and as Mandy Rose uh, talked at our, um, Mandy Rose, who's from IDOCS in Bristol, uh, a huge leader in this, in this field, um, also in introducing the platform and that uh, the the nonfiction uh, nonfiction interactive immersive emergent space starts to create very complex relationships between those four and perhaps more <laughs> uh, parties. Um, in the case of high rise, I can just speak uh, specifically, you know, um, we engage with real time um, in, in some of the projects, uh, you know, beyond the sort of the conventional documentary forms of interviewing people and, and that kind of relationship, we engage with real time data online, which we consider a documentary engagement. And so I think those those things all come into play when thinking about how to look back at this work. That's an, that's an ec excellent answer. And, and just, um... You know, looking at your own projects that you've been working on and we'll come back to in detail a little bit later, there's such an extraordinary cache and rich set of production materials that are that are generated and continue to be generated, I imagine, long after any commissioning bodies would consider the project uh, delivered. Uh, in lieu of where we are and where archives are at the moment in terms of resource and, and the ability to, to commit to preservation in a, in a fuller sense, does documentation, do that, does that rich set of materials currently represent the best endeavor, the best chance for preserving the, 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 the sort of essence of a project, do you think? It's a start, I would say, and, and certainly it's something that we struggled along the way. I mean, when we started Filmmaker in Residence back in the day in 2004, we had the National Film Board of Canada. We were already dealing with sort of content questions around uh, new engagements or, or, or co-creative engagements with communities, um, but also form. And the NFB kept asking us to make a feature film documentary to, you know, to record the yeah. process. And we always push back on that saying we want to, it's too much, it's too much and it's not the right kind of weight to put on this project. We feel like a web documentary is going to do that. 
So it's, it's, you know, we really struggled with that along the way, thinking that maybe, you know, if we make cinema about the work, somehow we will preserve some of these more intricate and hidden parts of the project, as William talked about, the process. Um, and the process for us has always been as important as the product. And to be honest, as a maker, after doing this kind of work for 20 years, I was really honored to come to join William and Sarah because of the frustration I felt about having to reinvent the wheel constantly about co-creative processes, not just in the preservation of it, but the funding of it and the acknowledgement of that as being such a central part of the work. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it, it is uh, part of our big agenda at uh, ODL right now. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, and uh, Jesse, I was wondering if you, from, from the uh, Netherlands Institute of Sound and Vision perspective, is is that focus on documentation, uh, you know, while while the community still is developing its methodologies around the, the collection of, of the, the thing, let's call it. I know that's exactly what we're here to debate, but the, the thing, the project as experienced, is that is that emphasis on documentation one that you have adopted? Um, it's, it's one that we're exploring. Um, previously, Kasper mentioned work that we're currently doing with uh, Eleni, my colleague, uh, is, is, is doing interviews as directors talk about their projects uh, of these interactive documentaries. So I, I think that's a really big step forward in large part because of the technical limitations of actually preserving the interactive work. So it's just a, a pragmatic choice, um, which... Um, you know, allows us to work with formats that we've worked with for years that we've, we're actually quite good at, that we can kind of put out guarantees about the preservation of these, uh, these archival objects. Um, it also means that we can contextualize these works as we archive them. So it enables us to create additional context by having a maker's perspective on it. Uh, some, some things that would definitely be lost if we would only focus on the production itself. That's uh, very specific to a certain context. And to ask questions about why it was made uh, and things like that. That's not implicit in a, in a production per se, uh, if it's seen in 50 to 100 years from now. Um, but we do lose a lot of things. I think what's so beautiful about these productions is the way they, uh, they invite interaction and sort of embodied and visceral experiences, um, which I think are very difficult to document. Um, so I, I, I still think it's a worthwhile cause to to strive for um, the, the preservation of the interactive experience itself. Yeah, that's that, that's fascinating. I mean, it, one of the themes that certainly keeps coming up at the, at the BFI um, uh, where I work and where we're exploring, where we're piloting the acquisition of two uh, headset-based experiences is, is helping our colleagues to understand that there's uh, a step change needs to occur in terms of the in terms of what you described, William, actually, as the as the the the, the re understanding of the curatorial emphasis or the relationship between creators of works and the people that end up acquiring those works. And, and William, I was wondering in your in, in your experience um, at MIT, in in cases where archives. Uh, or conservationists are only able to meet creators halfway, and I mean halfway in the sense that they're unable to commit to the full preservation of a project as experienced by audiences or as intended by an artist. What are the minimum requirements needed to, to preserve the core integrity of a project? Or as someone po more poetically described it earlier, the soul, the soul of a project. How are we gonna get, to, what are the frameworks to have those discussions with creators that, that are needed to understand what the soul of a project is? Well, I think that's the place to start a conversation and to document those conversations. Um, that's a really important. Right now, we're at a stage where this stuff is so nascent that it's all everything is kind of made on demand, and um, it's and therefore it requires a kind of made on demand engagement. We have to talk to them and say what's important to you from this. Um, it would be great to encourage makers from the get go to already begin that process themselves and start start to to acquire things. I wish there were a single answer, you know, something you could say uh, would quickly be taken, I'm afraid, by some institutions as the cheap answer, like, the, you know, the, the um, 
So, you know, walkthroughs are a way to hold something. I, I mean, I go back to the paper prints. I don't think anyone imagined that paper prints of, of celluloid would be the would be our salvation, you know, 50, 100 years later. It turned out to be that way. Okay, that's an easy case because the photograph, reconstituting the photograph is, is, a, is a relatively simple step compared to this stuff. But certainly walkthroughs, interviews with makers, um, documentation about the project in whatever way is, is, is possible. The problem is that there's no one appointed to do that. I think if, if an artist's ego is big enough, they may take it upon themselves to sort of build their store their legacy, build their pyramid. But it strikes me that organizations, funding organizations need to just put this in as a budget item. You know, it's not that hard. When I buy a refrigerator here in the Netherlands, there's a, there's a relatively hefty fee that's thinking ahead to the day that I dump that refrigerator and it's gotta be recycled. That fee is built into it. Well, this wouldn't so much be a recycling fee as a, as a preservation fee, something that, that mindfully builds a budget and a place for that, for that future. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to hold off on talking about funding actually in institutions because I would like to come back to that. But but to continue the the first part of that thought and to put this question to all three um, panelists, uh, it, obviously the desire would be for the relationship between creators and filmmakers and practitioners to embed themselves and reach out to archives and curators and conservationists right at the beginning of a project, right when they're thinking about it, so that we can all help uh, each other develop methodologies and pathways between creators and archives. The reality is, um, and this is as true with filmmaking as many other creative projects, that budgets are tight, time is pressureful, creators have to deliver projects quickly to various commissioning and funding bodies. Um, in, in, in the filmmaking realm, uh, even on-set photographers get a hard time for slowing down production. How can we genuinely create context other than outside of, of well-founded sort of lab experiences for archives, archivists, curators to, to embed themselves early in, in, the, in the creation of productions? Um, Kat, you talked about how lucky you were to have a producer uh, on your team who who was who was sort of naturally archivally minded, I, but I imagine that is that is an exception rather than a rule. So I'd just like to ref reflect on that. Um, while you're while you're on my screen uh, in large, William, could you could you take the bat on on that one first, just to talk about that dynamic? Sure. I mean, this is a familiar, historically speaking, a very familiar problem. There was zero interest in preservation in in, in the film business yeah. until the coming of video. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, you know what? That old stuff has a, maybe has a second life. And suddenly, and there were a lot of legal actions and you guys know that as much as anyone where producers would go back to archives that had done the, the expensive and hard work of preserving things and then laying an IP, uh, intellectual property claim on them to pull that, to, to drag that stuff back and then market it as video cassettes or DVDs. So I think it's about, I think to me, it's about education. I'm an educator, so that's what I would say. But, but what our lab tries to do is bring these, bring these folks together, bring the archivists, the technologists, the funders, and the producers together in one room at one table and say, look, this someday could be an issue and we have to think about it now. And we have to think about it as a, as an ecosystem, not just as like, oh, you're the one responsible for this. And, you know, because these are, and because these are nascent categories, it's very slippery. It's very hard to, to put the finger on, you know, that's why it requires customization. But I think the first step is education, sensitizing people to the need to hold some of this as legacy for the future and to find ways we have to just invent those at the front end. It doesn't come naturally and it certainly hasn't come about historically. If we're able to do it now, we'll be, we'll be breaking that rule of, uh, of lethargy and ignorance that's, uh, that's so cursed the past. Yeah, I'd like to come back to that actually, but I'm going to jump over to Kat just to say, Kat, for, for High Rise is, was already a multifaceted project. It now sits as a multifaceted project in a, in a, in a cosmology <laughs> of other spin-offs and franchises, all of which could be considered by some measure to be the project, quote unquote. It's huge, it's sprawling, which is, which is what makes it attractive and fascinating. It involves user-generated content and it, and it is authored and it is co-collaborated. Is there a soul of that project? And how would you, if you know, if you were really pushed to protect some core elements of it, how would you start? And how did you think about that with your producer? Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a really 
<laughs> Good question. I mean, the soul of the project is um, what we always hoped or thought about was um, that there's a DNA embedded in anything that we do in the high rise project. And that is quite simply that we take the high rise building, this architectural form, and use it as a storytelling lens on, on, with, in a documentary way. And that's, that's it. And so that that became, you know, people ask me seven years in, aren't you bored? Aren't you sick of doing high rise? Don't you want to move on? I'm like, no, no, not at all. Because it's just it, that, that little piece of DNA allows us to do anything. Um, and so that became that, that central organizing principle uh, was, was just a way in which as a documentarian, I could engage with many different communities, many different technologies and continue a conversation, an ongoing living documentary. Um, so I don't know if that helps to, to answer your question. I, I do think, I just wanna go back to something that uh, William was talking about and the question you posed to him. Um, and I just wanna emphasize the importance of, uh, you know, there is the importance of documenting the work as it unfolds, but there's, you know, the, the thing that Jerry Flahive did in our project was really think about the legal and intellectual property questions of, the, of these works. And I just really want to emphasize that because NFB has, you know, 8,000 films oh. uh, and in the process of digitizing that collection, which was an incredible feat back in the day, you know, 10, 10, 15 years ago, only 2,000 of them could make it to the web screen because, not because they didn't exist, but because of the legal issues involved in specific, you know, one piece of music could knock out an entire documentary film because they had lost the rights to it. And so th that really is what allowed us to continue, you know, this, this book. Um, we had to go back and look at every piece of consent uh, uh, for every photograph and every interview. Um, and we, we went through that process to make the book. So I just want to kind of add that yeah. level of complication to it. Uh, and, and one of the, uh, I don't know whether you find this anxiety making, I, I think I would, is that is that some of the, your assets are sort of spread around. Uh, they're housed, d depending on what, what angle you're looking at the project from, they're housed, some of it is at the National Film Board of Canada. I think you said some of it is with, in a photographic repository. Does it, is there any, uh, it's probably not an analogy that stands up very well, but do you, do you are you, happy and secure about the the current level of of um care that the national film board of canada has offered to your assets does it in any way represent a sort of uncut negative <laughs> of your project that you know based on whatever emulatory possibilities exist 50 years down the line you you think that's that's okay for me to sleep at night because i think whatever else happens they're there and it's a best endeavor it represents a sort of leap of faith collecting principle yeah, I mean, I think they've done the best they can in this transition. I, I think there's more to be done. And I think that there is a national project <clears throat> at the NFB to, um, to open up to new media forums, but also to, uh, to document them and preserve them for Canadians. And I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure what that is. So um, it's, it's a tough question. You know, I'm, I'm really honored that the work still is up on the web. I mean, I know I have colleagues who work independently and they can't, they can't pay, they're not, they, you know, they're not paying, they haven't paid the server to hold the, the, the material up. So I think it's all a, a question of relative, relativity and, and, um, you know, capacity for, for institutions to maintain this work. I mean, just, yeah. just keeping a website going is hard. So yeah, I appreciate course, that. But, course. At the BFI, we've been trying to develop a, 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 a basic toolkit that allows curators to approach makers, and it involves some quite rudimentary tools like a questionnaire that asks creators to, to, to say, to, it basically tries to get at the question, what is the minimum acceptable threshold for acquisition for you below which your project doesn't make any sense anymore in any, in any sort of context? And Jesse, I was wondering, from your perspective as another, for institute to institute, how, do, what are the tools that you use to talk to creators and how have you been working with them early on in terms of thinking about collecting their project? Um, so I, I would almost say we haven't early okay. on. Um, that's, it's something that we've been wanting to do. Uh, but so I think speaking from the Dutch situation, I could imagine that this is very much the same in other countries as well, is that these, uh, exactly what William said at his uh, earlier talk, um, these 
productions, they evade any kind of categorization and therefore are institutions that are established around specific forms of media. Most of the times books go to libraries, paper goes to archives, AV goes to an audiovisual archive, uh, film goes to film archive, etc. They, they evade these in so many ways that everyone can point at each other and uh, avoid the, the responsibility. Um, and I think that the same has been true for the Netherlands uh, or our, our own institution. So um, uh, I, I think we're very much to blame ourselves that we've been sort of on the back seats um, and, and doing important work around radio and television. But these new media forms, including uh, things like games and websites, they have sort of overwhelmed us. And we're still, we're still you know, scrambling just to, to get a grip on it. Well, and we're doing I, this yeah. by these beautiful experiments. And I'm really happy that we can collaborate with DocLab and they can put us in touch with these creators. But it's so much a work in progress to establish these relations, relationships and take that responsibility. I think it's that, but and also the idea of holistic collection, if you like, uh, is 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 somewhat new to archives. Like you say, who, who have traditionally separated out elements with different curators. The idea of one curator dealing with, uh, you know, an entire creative community in the case mm -hmm. of High Rise or something is quite, it, it does require a shift in, in institutional thinking, I think, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and I it, wanted to, it, oh, sorry, no, yes, if I could just, uh, just add, I mean, it strikes me also that, I mean, to, to, to counter a little bit what Jesse said, this kind of event and, and the emergence of labs with some archives and, and uh, Sound and Vision has, has been really doing good work in terms of sort of cultivating an experimental space within the archive. Festivals have been doing a great job with it, developing kind of lab as, as Sundance and, and, and Tribeca, uh, IDFA. So I think that's really an interesting idea as well to, for, the, for the archive, not just to be a place that preserves, but also for a place that experiments mm -hmm. and in experimenting engages in these new spaces and thinks about what that means in terms of taxonomy, categories, strategies, techniques. That's the, that should, there should be an R&D wing within, and there, and there is in a number of organizations. And I really applaud that. I think that's a great way to go. Yeah, um, I, it sort of takes me on to my to my final question, really, or my final theme, which is there is another uh, relationship in the triangle, which is art. There's archive, if you like. There's creative community, and then there's funding entity or supporting entity or stakeholder or whatever you'd like to call it. Be that a festival, or a lab, uh, or an institute, all of which require tremendous resource. All of which currently battle with their just to maintain their collections of perhaps more uh, easily manageable media, let's let's call it, or media that they've developed, established frameworks for the preservation of. As you referenced yourself, William, it was 40 years before the film archive movement developed in the 1930s. There had already been almost 40 years of cinema history, a lot of which is now lost, unfortunately. How, you know, in times of budget cuts with funders uh, tightening their belts and with the possibility that the, the big brand technological drivers of a lot of these media might withdraw, might move on to new things. How, how can we make the argument to close the time gap between, like, basically, what, how do we avoid losing 30 years on this in the lobbying effort? I know it's a big question, apologies, but <laughs> I'm looking to you. <laughs> I wish I had an answer. I mean, like in the in the Dutch scene, it, it turns out that conservative politicians, um, one of the one of the in my world, few advantages to a conservative is they sometimes are heritage oriented, and that's that's a useful pitch. This is the heritage of the future, yeah. and and invest in it. Second thing I think is is kind of trying to argue, and this is what we're trying to do at the at the big table with all the players, that this has to be a budget category. This is not something delayed until the you know. True, everyone is focused on getting the funds to go into production and making the damn thing. But but actually, part of that budget needs to be, a percentage needs to be put in there for the future. Um, like I said, the same way we do it with refrigerators. And I don't know, I've got to look into that history of how it came to be with fridges and microwaves, but I'm sure that it wasn't easy, um, but it was important. And it's important to sort of saving our ecosystem. Well, we can do the same thing for saving our cultural uh, future. Yeah. Well, the fact that there's so many of us here today means there's at least a, a you know a minimum groundswell of passionate advocates for the for the field. So that's that's a start. Um